Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm Shah, and in this video, I'm going to continue the series on decision trees and talk about a couple of applications. So in the last two videos of the series, we talked about how we can train predictive models using decision trees. So in the first video, we just talked about models employing a single decision tree. Then in the second video, we expanded this idea to tree ensembles. So if you haven't already, be sure to check those out because we're going to build upon those ideas in this video. The whole point of the discussion today is that we can use machine learning models, specifically decision trees, for more than just making predictions. So this is what I'll call next level uses of decision trees, not because they're anything profound or groundbreaking, but because they go beyond this obvious task of just using a machine learning model to make a prediction. And I think for those who are just getting started in data science, it may be easy to think that that all there is to data science is getting some data, training a model, and making predictions. And that somehow through this process, there's gonna be immediate real world impact in value. And the reality is it's not so straightforward. So what I really like about data science is the critical thinking and the creativity that's required to use these tools and techniques to solve real world problems and provide value. And so that's all I mean by next level. So toward that end, in this video, I'll talk about two two ways we can use decision trees for more than just making predictions. So the first is reducing predictor count, and the second is called predictor segmentation. Starting with the first one, reduce predictor count. So this goes back to the previous video of the series where we talked about tree ensembles, where we stitched together a bunch of decision trees, which made our machine learning model more robust. While decision tree ensembles give us so many great things, like I was talking about in the previous video, all these great things come at a cost which is that tree ensembles are a bit of a black box. So we know what we put into the tree ensemble and we can see what comes out of it, but what happens in between is a bit of a mystery. And this is a problem for a lot of machine learning models. We may get this great predictive performance, but a lot of times it's not so easy to interpret what's happening under the hood. However, we don't have to use our tree ensemble to make our final predictions. Rather, what we can do is take the feature importance ranking from our tree ensemble ensemble model and use that to inform a simpler set of predictor variables. And so this is all motivated by Occam's razor, which is a very popular idea. And in this context, what it implies is that simpler models are better. So let's say that we have our tree ensemble model and it has 30 predictor variables to it. But following the logic here, what we want to do is take these 30 variables and just keep the handful of variables that are most important. So not only does this help us in interpreting what the model is doing, but in a lot of cases, it can actually lead to an improvement in predictive performance. So walking through what this might look like, we take our tree ensemble and we spit out our feature importance ranking. Then what we can do is take the top predictor, train a machine learning model from it. So this could be a decision tree, it could be a logistic regression model, linear model, neural network. It really doesn't matter what kind of model we use it for. We use the one predictor to develop a model and then we assess that model's performance. Then we can do this same exact thing for the top two predictors. So now we have a model with two variables. We grab its performance metrics for three models, four models, and so on and so forth. So we just keep doing this until we have all the predictors in our original tree ensemble model. Once we go through this process, we can plot a chart that looks something like this, where on the x-axis, we have the number of variables included in the model. And then on the y-axis, we have some performance measures. So here I put AUC just as an example. Each of these points correspond response to a different model, and we can see the gain in predictive performance here. So for example, we kind of see that we have pretty big gains until we hit about three variables. So what this tells us is maybe we don't need all six variables, and we can just get away with using three of them without a major loss in predictive performance. And so the upside of that, like I mentioned earlier, is that a model with three input variables is a little easier to interpret than a model with six or 60 input variables. So now I'm going to walk through some examples code of doing this. So here I'm going to use the same data set that I used in the previous video of the series. So there's a bit of overlap between the code here and from the previous video. So I'm not going to spend too much time on any recurring details. But if you want to learn more, check out that video. And also the code is available at the GitHub linked down here and linked in the description below. First step, as always, is importing modules. This is a lot of the same stuff as the example code from the previous video, with the only addition of this import here where we're bringing in 
in a logistic regression model from SK Learn. And then as always, we're gonna load in our data. Next, we're doing some data prep. This is very similar to what we saw in the previous video. This is something new where all I'm doing here is since Y is a Boolean variable, meaning it can only take values of zero or one, all I'm doing is switching the meaning of zero and one. So originally zero meant the tumor was malignant and one meant the tumor was benign. And all I'm doing with this transformation is switching. One means the tumor is malignant and zero means the tumor is benign. And the reason I'm doing this is that later down the line, when it comes to interpreting what the coefficients of our logistic regression model mean, it's just a bit more intuitive to talk about things in terms of risk of breast cancer, as opposed to the opposite, which would be like safety from breast cancer. And then this should also be a review where we're using SMOT to balance our imbalanced data set. So we have way more benign cases than malignant cases. So all SMOT is doing is synthetically oversampling the minority class. And then we're using this train test split function to create our training and testing data sets. Okay, so now we can train our random forest. So this is one of the tree ensemble methods we saw in the previous video. So we can fit that model with just a couple lines of code. So next we have something new. Everything up until this point we basically did in the previous video, but now we're kind of going into some novelty. So all we're doing here is pulling the feature importances from our random forest model and then we're sorting them in descending order. So what this looks like is this where these are all the names of our features and these numbers here quantify their relative importance. And so now what we can do is exactly the process I was describing before where we train a model using the top predictor and assess its performance and we train another model using the top two predictors assess the performance top three assess performance, so on and so forth. So what this looks like in code could be something like this, where we're initializing all these lists to store our classifiers and then to store our different performance measures. We can ignore this i equals zero here. This is just left over from an earlier version of the code. What we're doing here is for i corresponding to the number of elements in this series, we're gonna go through one by one and do the following block of code. So what we're doing here is listing the feature names up until i plus one. We train our logistic regression model using this line of code. And then we're just appending things to these lists from before. So we're appending the classifier to the classifier list. We're appending the AUC value for the training data set. And then we're appending the AUC value for the testing data set. If this is confusing and complicated, don't worry. What matters is this final result, which is just like what we saw before, which is our number of variables plotted on the x-axis and then the performance of the models on the y-axis. So this red dashed line is the AUC value for the random forest model we trained originally. So this is a tree ensemble model that uses all 30 predictor variables. But what's really remarkable is that once we hit five variables, the logistic regression model actually outperforms this more sophisticated model that uses six times as many variables. And then you can see after after five variables, the logistic regression models just keep getting better and better. But let's say for our purposes, we really value being able to interpret what the model is doing as well as the model's accuracy. So let's say once we beat our random force model, we're satisfied. So that's the model we're gonna use. And then since logistic regression is a linear model, we can easily interpret the relationship between our predictor variables and the target variable by looking at the model coefficients. And so the bars here are just showing the coefficient values. Looking at worst perimeter, which is about 0.3, the way to interpret this is a unit increase in worst perimeter translates to a 0.3 increase in the log odds that the tumor is malignant. So I know that was a mouthful, making that a bit more qualitative. As the worst perimeter increases, the probability that the tumor is malignant also increases. So now we kind of have the concrete quantification of the interaction between our predictor variables and the probability that the tumor is malignant. And so there's a small technical detail here that I don't wanna to spend too much time on, but I talk about more in the blog. And it has to do with the resampling. Since we use SMOT to synthetically oversample the minority class, we can't immediately translate our logistic regression model outputs two probabilities. And that's just because the y-intercept for our logistic regression model is biased due to the oversampling.
sampling. And so there's a simple fix there. We can just adjust our y-intercept to make it not biased, and then everything works perfectly. And so if you want to learn more about that, check out the blog. Okay, next we have predictor variable segmentation. And this actually goes back to the first blog in this series, where we used a decision tree model for sepsis survival prediction. And there, the final decision tree we had looked like this. And what's interesting here is even though we had three predictor variables, the vast majority of these splits are only using age. So here the initial split is splitting on ages less than or equal to 58.5 years, and then 44.5, 78.5, 56.5, 67, 86. So this is really interesting. What this is indicating is that when it comes to sepsis survival, age is the most important risk factor we have in our data set. And so the other ones we had were the sex of the patient and also the number of previous sepsis episodes. And so sometimes in cases like this, where there's one predictor variable that has this outsized impact on our target, it can make sense to do segmentation on that predictor variable. And what that means is all we're doing is taking this continuous variable age and we're going to partition it into discrete sections. So kind of looking at this visually, let's say we have ages in our data set ranging from zero to a hundred. All segmentation does is split these ages into some number of subcategories. So let's say we want to split it into five subcategories and then the result looks like this. And so what you can do now is instead of training a decision tree on all of your data, you can train separate decision trees for each age group. And what this can translate to is better model performance, especially if there are systematic differences between these age groups, which requires separate model development. So the question is, how do we come up with these segments? So we can definitely do it manually. So we just kind of look at the data and say, oh, okay, let's do this age group and that age group or use some kind of subject matter expertise. But another way we can do it is using a decision tree. So this picture here is showing how we can come up with these segments using a decision tree. You notice that age is actually being split into these different sections based on the sepsis outcome of dead or alive. But maybe we wouldn't want to use this decision tree directly because it has this other variable involved in the splits. So what we can do is train another decision tree model, but now instead of using the three predictors of age, sex, and number of sepsis episodes, we can just use the one variable we care about, which is age. So now I'm going to walk through what that looks like. I'm going to use the same data set from the first video of this series. And then as always, we're going to start by importing our modules. So these shouldn't be anything new. Next, we're going to load in our data, just like we did in the first video. And then we're going to do some data prep. So here, all we're doing is keeping the variables of age and the sepsis survival flag. And now we're going to do a little bit of data prep. So what we're doing here is we're grouping the data based on age. So you can imagine that we have all these different patients and there can be multiple patients of the same age. So all we're doing here is reshuffling the data to have only unique age values. But then for each of these unique age values, we're going to have a percent of patients that are alive. And then we're going to name this column percent alive. And then on the flip side, we can take one minus the percent alive and create a new column called percent not alive. And so the result of that is a data frame that looks like this. So now we only have unique age values starting from zero going all the way up to a hundred. And then for each age value, we have the percentage of them that are alive and the percentage of them that are dead. Next, all we're doing here is grabbing the variable names and creating separate data frames for our input and target variable. So here the predictor variable is age. The target variable is going to be percent not alive. And as a first pass to the relationship, we can just plot them against each other. So on the x axis, we have age and on the y axis, we have percent not alive. So as percent not alive goes up, that's an indication that the risk of sepsis increases. So you can see around midlife, there's this clear uptrend of the percent of patients that are not surviving their sepsis episode. But before that, this risk is 
is relatively low and stable. And so just looking at this plot, we could probably chop up this data into any number of segments based on this risk. So maybe we would do like zero to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 80, 80 to 100, like whatever. But this is just us eyeballing it. And it'll be interesting to compare this intuition to what the decision tree is gonna spit out. Okay, moving forward, we can now train our decision tree model. So here we can define our number of bins by controlling the maximum number of leaf nodes in our decision tree regressor. And the reason this works is that, as we saw in the first video, a fully grown decision tree on this data is just massive. So you can virtually have any number of bins that you like and it'll work. And then finally, we just fit our data to the decision tree. And now with the decision tree in hand, we can go in and grab all the split values in an automated way. So this code is a bit involved, so I won't spend too much time on it. But for those who are curious, you can take a look at it here. And it's also available at the GitHub repository linked here. But the final result looks something like this. So here we have the same plot from before where we have age and years plotted against the percent not alive. And so this is qualitatively pretty similar to what we were talking about before. Like maybe we would have put one here and then adjusted the rest. But this is kind of a tricky problem because if I shift this border from here to here to make this first bin look a little better, now this bin may not look as good because now you're mixing together these lower risk patients with these higher risk patients. And then from a treatment standpoint, that may not make a whole lot of sense. That's one of the upsides of using a decision tree and leveraging that greedy search to define these bins because it already is doing that tricky optimization for us. And then as a final note, I'll just say to take all these with a grain of salt, just because the decision tree spits out these optimal age buckets, this may not translate well to treatment strategies. And so as opposed to just taking this as gospel, this is more of a starting place and may just serve better than just arbitrarily drawing lines for these different age groups. Okay, that's it. So if you want to learn more, be sure to check out the blog published on Medium and linked in the description below. Feel free to steal the code from the GitHub repository and apply it to use cases or projects that you're working on. And if you enjoyed this content, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing your thoughts in the comments section below. I do read all the comments and I find all the questions and feedback that I receive very valuable. And as always, thank you for your time and thanks for watching.